Hello and uh, welcome to Job Math, the podcast for Gen Z professionals. Uh, I'm Dale. And I'm Lisa. This podcast is for you if you want to unleash your potential and get the career that you want. Today, we are lifting the lid on careers in Silicon Valley and especially product management. And who better to talk to than someone who's been a product manager, head and VP of product at multiple San Francisco based startups and technology companies. Someone who, as we like to say, has been there, seen it, and done it all. So we are joined by our distinguished guest. Jason, would you please introduce yourself? Thanks, and I, that's, that's a hell of an intro. Um, so <laughs> hi, uh, I, am, I am Jason Ling. Uh, I, uh, I've been a, a product leader who has seen and done it all, apparently, uh, <laughs> for, for quite a number of years. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm really, really happy to be here and kind of share my, my experiences and my mistakes and my learnings and everything. And in hopes that anyone who wants to be a product manager can, can really understand exactly what they're, they're getting into. So thank you. No, thank you, Jason. I mean, that's exactly why we're here. So uh, for the benefit of listeners, um, give us a background to your, give us a summary of your background, maybe, you know, where you grew up, where did you study, and, and then how did your career progress from there? Sure. So uh, I, I kind of grew up uh, a lot of places, uh, mainly on the East Coast of the United States, New England, uh, things like that. I've been out here in California now going on a very long time. I moved here in early, uh, late 99, early 2000. So I've been here for about 24 years here in, uh, here in California, split half of it down in Los Angeles. Uh, and then here in San Francisco, uh, studied in New York, Germany, and, uh, was, was originally thinking, you know what? I, 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 I want to be an engineer because, because growing up, I always was this whole thing of, I like building things. I like making things. I, I like, I like solving problems and, and like, and like it's a lot of fun. And I was a big nerd with no friends and lots and lots of comic books. <laughs> so, uh, I ended up doing that. And then, um, which actually brought me to California. My first, my first engineering job was working at IBM back in the day when, when the internet was still trying to be figured out on like, what is this thing? How do we make money on it? And dear God, what is that website that was happening? Um, and, uh, yeah, so I started with technology background. Uh, I was an engineer for six months before I realized I made a horrible, horrible mistake. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for, for those of you, if, if you're, if we're, if you're sitting there listening and you think you've made a horrible mistake, you, you probably have just like I have. <laughs> um, and that's when I, I pivoted to, uh, to product management. Well, first project management and then product management. Um, so for the last 20 years, I've worked for big companies, startups, like, like Lisa, like you said earlier, uh, big companies. I've worked for Disney. I worked for universal back in the day. Uh, I worked for MySpace. Not that that doesn't even remotely matter anymore. Uh, although I hear that they're doing a documentary, so I'm waiting to get the email because I have stories. I have so many stories. Um, and then, uh, I got bit by the startup bug and and moved moved my family here to the San Francisco Bay Area in early 2010 where I was involved in really early mid-stage uh tech startups um out of I've had five I've been involved in five early mid-stage startups uh four of them have had exits which I'm incredibly lucky to have worked with an amazing group of engineers and designers and other product managers and and things like that and you know, grinding away 12, 14 hour days. And, and you do that for two years and the hopes that somebody buys you and then you can take six months off and then do it all over again. <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of what I've been up to. So it's great. So that story started as an engineer, moved mm -hmm. into project management and then ultimately product management. Yep. Maybe for the benefits of listeners who haven't been in San Francisco for or on, on the West <laughs> coast in California for the last 20 years. Um, maybe explain the difference between those roles and, and maybe, you know, lift a little bit about what is the reality of the role of product manager and product manager. Oh, sure. So, um, I mean, I, I was an engineer, I was a Java engineer. That's a, a pretty, pretty standard cut 
and I got tired of it. Uh, and the reason why I got tired of it is honestly, it's like I got tired of just writing code. I wanted to build things. I wanted to build experiences. And uh, I, uh, I studied psychology in the back in, in, in my life and really kind of understanding like the user ultimately, like I think my epiphany was like the user doesn't care how it works. They just want it to work. They want that experience. They have certain they have certain expectations. Like the 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 saying that I've said for years and years and years is like there's a universe behind every button that you tap that you don't care about. You just want it to work. So I then kind of trans transitioned into project management because I it was this whole thing of like, okay, well, I know how to build something from from my engineering background. Now it's a matter of like, okay, how can I properly start building it and of course you project management like it's the whole nuts and bolts of like how how when is it going to be done how is it going to be done all the coordinating kind of kind of aspect to it um very tactical i would say their project management is very very tactical um which i love which which was absolutely fantastic and then as as with with you know most most things eventually i got bored <laughs> of just doing the tactical um and then went into like product where it was like really focusing on the user. And the thing is, is like pro product management has, I mean, it's gone through probably three different iterations of, of like what a product manager is. Um, like, like just recently, you know, Brian Chesky at Airbnb made made a comment about there's no we don't have product managers anymore and then of course you know all of silicon valley just just has has a minor heart attack as as the 84 product managers that work at airbnb go well time to get back on linkedin i guess brian said we don't exist anymore <laughs> but it's it's not true it's like it it evolves because i've always seen like product management is your your kind of and i'm going to warn you right now i am filled with aphorisms so <laughs> so bear with me um, it's like, it's the hub. It's, it's the hub of the wheel. Like, uh, like originally product management, you probably heard like years and years and years ago. It's the, well, the product manager is the CEO of their product. It's like, yeah, that kind of made sense maybe like 15 years ago, because there was this whole notion of like, you're very business oriented, you're, you're very operational oriented and things like that, which totally makes sense. But then as the technology has evolved and as companies have really kind of evolved and also more importantly, more like user needs have evolved over over the years that whole idea of a product manager and our responsibilities and and what we're supposed to do has also evolved as well where now it's very much more business oriented it's much more experiential oriented it's really being that user centric um that's really kind of your focus. It's it's kind of like the big the big three now. I think for for like successful product management is to think about one: Are you delighting your users? Like you know, if you want to put it in raw metrics, it's like what's your NPS? Because like, is, are your users delighted with the experience that you've just provided them? Second, is it going to be cheap to build this thing and to roll it out from a business perspective? And then of course, number three is always is always revenue. Is it a revenue generating thing? As we've seen in the last like year and a half, two years with the massive layoffs that have started happening here in Silicon Valley and around the world and stuff like that, companies are focusing more on, on the whole philosophy of we need to do more with less. Revenue matters. So product managers now, they have now part of their remit is revenue. Is your product generating revenue? Is your feature supporting that revenue generation? And I, I like this because... Now it's now thinking more about outcomes and not outputs because with outputs, you're, I mean, I'm sorry, but if you're, if you're a company listening and you are so like dead focused on like what features are shipping at the end of every sprint, you really need to take a hard look at yourselves because you're just a feature factory and like, do those features matter? What is the outcome of what you're trying to do? And that's kind of the new, in my observation, in my opinion, is that is the new thinking of a product manager. We're now thinking about outcomes and not just, we have a roadmap and we have a backlog and we have our sprints and we develop and we're cranking out. It's like, that's fantastic. But like, what are y'all actually trying to do? And how does that roll up into the overall organizational goals? What are your outcomes? 
that's kind of how it is now. I mean, it's and and anyway, with everything now, everyone is data heavy, which is fantastic because you need to make data driven decisions. But if you don't have the data, you also kind of need to have a hypothesis. And like, I hate to say this, but wing it. Like, I have this idea. Let's see if it works. How how quickly can I put something out there and get feedback to see if I'm right or wrong? Like that has to be ingrained in in your DNA. I have met so many product managers and have hired so many product managers with so many different backgrounds. Like some are technical and they come like me. They used to be in engineering. There are some that came from marketing. There are some that came from project management. There are some that came from like so many MBAs, um, so many biz- business life. And it's like, but as long as you, but at the end of the day, you're a maker. Like you like making things that people enjoy and that are successful. I think that's that's like the foundation of product management. Fantastic. To build off of that, I'm curious, since we're talking about the changes that you've already seen occur, I'm curious if if and how you see AI affecting the role of product I was waiting for the AI management. question. <laughs> I thought you were just going to go there. You were close. No, we're no, gonna... I was just waiting for the AI question. <laughs> We're all going to be replaced by chat GPT <laughs> and Bard. It's all over. We're all done. Close it up. It's everything going to be great. Um, I, I I have an opinion about AI that has gotten mixed reviews from people, but I'll say it anyway. The current incarnation of AI is basically it's an unpaid intern that you have to be very specific in what you want. And you're going to get back about 80% of what you were hoping for. And then you still have to work with it. So I see it as an amazing time saver. I see it as efficient. I personally have written about a half a dozen GPTs myself through chat GPT to like, what are some like, I hate to say this, but like boring paperwork stuff that I just don't want to deal with that would take me three hours to do, but I could throw it into AI and it gets it cranked out in like 10 minutes. That's how I see AI now. It's it's a wonderful tool, but and I get I get why a lot a lot of companies out there are kind of swinging the pendulum the other way, going like we're going to get rid of entire departments because now we have AI and everything is great and everything is like that. I'm going to tell you this, and this is going to be like I'm, if I'm wrong, it's this is this is on the record, and I'm wrong, it'll be fantastic. We've got it. I know. Um. <laughs> Product management is never going to be replaced by AI because the number one thing that AI doesn't understand is why. It doesn't understand the the question why. And that is the number one question. That is the thing that every product manager should be asking like half a dozen times a day. Like, why is that? Why are we doing it this way? Why, Why do you care about this? AI doesn't get now. I mean, who knows? But as of now, like, it, it just doesn't get it. It's, it's what I, what I've said before also is, is like, if you're looking at data, that's all AI is, it's just data. It's, it's, it's analyzing data, constructing data, uh, creating data, whole nine yards. But data isn't just quantitative data. That's only half, half the picture. Cause then you have the qualitative side of it because quantitative data. And I use the, the, um, uh, the sign up flow kind of textbook example of this. You have a sign up flow and you see that at this particular step, 30, you have a 37% drop-off rate. Okay, cool. Your quantitative data is going to tell you you have a 37% drop-off rate at this point. It doesn't tell you why. That's the qualitative side of it. That's where now you have to go and be obsessed with your users. You have to know your users better than you know the, than they know themselves. You have to interact with them. You need to collaborate with them. You need to, you need to, to communicate with them and understand the nuances and the context of like, well, why are all of y'all dropping off like this? Well, this checkout screen is dumb because I have to click like four things and I should only click one. AI is not going to tell you that. It's not. So I, I, I'm not worried. Like, I just laugh when everyone says like, oh, we're all going to be replaced with AI. I'm like, no, fine. I mean, if you are, maybe it's going to sound mean, but maybe you should take a look at how good of a job you're doing. So, uh, yeah, uh, I think you've helped us to completely lose our uh, spots in the, in the script, Jason. So, so congratulations. <laughs> um, so fast forwarding now, so t- maybe tell us a bit about your current role um, and what would you advise people who want to follow in your footsteps? Oh, sure. Um, 
So I just recently joined a uh, digital consultancy uh, called Ascendal. Uh, prior to that, I was with another larger digital consultancy. Uh, the larger one, I was the head of head of product management, so we had multiple clients, so forth and so on. It's you know every you know it's a, it's a digital consultancy. Companies come to us, come to us and go. We don't know what we're doing. We need help. Please help us. Um, and it's same thing with with this one at at Ascendal, where I'm I'm heading up. Uh, I'm the director of product strategy strategy there. So really, what it is 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 it's the I have this wonderful wonderful opportunity to meet with companies and organizations who to be candid woke up one morning and went we're doing things wrong and we need help um our competitors are eating our lunch we've been doing it we've been doing it the same way for the last 10 15 years it clearly isn't working because we absolutely know that there are four kids in Stanford in a dorm who are working on something that are that are going to beat our pants off in three years and we can't we can't risk that the technology has gotten too fast for us and we need help um which i i think is absolutely fantastic um like i said prior to that i've been a product you know i've i've worked in product companies where i've owned my own product and 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 things like that um i actually highly recommend that if you're a product manager regardless of your level um, you should do some form of consulting because in my mind, it really, really, really helps grow and stretch those soft skills. Like, you know how to be, we like, we all know, like product managers know how to be product managers. Like, okay, we have a backlog. I know how to, I have my roadmap. I know how to prioritize and and I own my product and I'm, I, I could be religious about looking at my data and my analytics and the other stuff like that. But it's the soft skills that I have found that's what gets you to like move up into that level of really being a product leader because it's not about the day to day. Like nobody, it's going to be blasphemous, but like nobody cares how your Jira stories are written. Like nobody cares if you want to keep, if you want to move on your career, you know, again, it's the outcomes over the outputs. And the only way that you can start learning and focusing on those outcomes is it's, it's stakeholder management. It's strategy. It's, it's, you know, diplomacy and negotiating and like really trying to think of that big picture of like, okay, how can we create this experience that will actually create real value? What is that real value? Let's start talking about that and let's go into it, understanding their pain points. Um, but yeah, and with consultancy, it is, it's, it's, it's 70% soft skills. It's like you have and this is what I've told every single product manager in previous a digital agencies that I've worked with that I've hired from product companies. I go, the biggest hurdle you're going to have to get over when you are a consultant as a product consultant is it's not your product. You're, you're going to have to give the baby back. And that's tough for a lot of people because I, I mean, listen, we're all us product managers, whether we want to admit it or not, are massively egotistical if you haven't picked that up because it's ours. Like we made this, this is mine. You can't, don't tell me it's wrong. The data says it's right. It's like, but you need to be able, you get to the certain threshold where you wake up one morning and go, you know what? It's not about me. It's about my user. It's about my customer. It's about that an experience. It's not about me. And, and I highly recommend whether you're doing it for fun because you have friends who work at companies and they want to pick your brain, or if you want to do it formally and kind of do your own thing, or you want to go work for an agency and, and, and a systems integrator and stuff like that. But I, I highly recommend it. And that, that's what I did because I stopped wanting to be like, I didn't want to build, I realized I realized the way that I wanted to leave my fingerprint on the world wasn't an app or a website that had hundreds of millions of people going into it. I wanted to leave my fingerprint by educating as best as I could, because I'm far from infallible, um, as best as I could on like building what matters like listening to your users, like it's, it's the whole, like, you know, I could fish for you or I can teach you to fish. I'd rather teach you to fish because it's fun. It's a lot of fun. That's what it is. 
That's yeah. great. This is making me think of, I'm sure you have other tips and advice. You briefly mentioned what you recommend and people you've hired. Mm -hmm. So for all of our followers who are thinking, okay, he's just laid out this great picture. That is what I want to do, right? Sure. Maybe they, maybe they now want to work for you Look. because you've just been so enticing to them <laughs> and they're going to flock to you after this. Um, from that perspective of presenting themselves great if they're looking to say right. go into a consultancy, what would you recommend? Like, what are the things you look for in that tangible process oh. of someone's applying? Yeah, that's that's a good one. So basically, what it all boils down to is is trust. So what I what I what I've always told people that I've I've mentored and managed and led and everything like that, I tell them that you know that you've 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 made it in in my book if during a conversation, if we're talking about a particular project and you want my feedback on like, well, you know, we're we're trying to work on this thing, but it looks like this might be a bit of an issue, but I think we have it handled. My like ultimate kind of like because I'm I'm a terrible manager. Um is is the if you hear from me well if you're not worried i'm not worried you've made it and the way that you build that up is honestly like don't make me worry about you like you're proactive you are obsessed with the user you you know how to you know you know how you you have a vision so as a product manager, you have a vision for what you're trying to do, whether that vision is coming from the top down, from, from the executive level, or, or if, if you're lucky enough and you are the executive level and you, have, you want to do your own startup and you have this, this wonderful vision, this wonderful idea, but you have this vision. A key skill, a, a tangible skill is storytelling and being able to tell that vision cross I say cross functionality, cross functions, I guess, like, because it, it, like telling, showing your, telling your vision to an engineer is way different than like telling your engineer to a designer or someone in BD or sales or marketing and everything like that. So you really need to know your audience when you're sharing that vision. You need to learn how to story tell. You need to, you, and, and have data to back it up. Like, like be obsessed with data. But again, like I said earlier, not just the numbers, the qualitative side as well. Be obsessed with the data. Be obsessed. Be obsessed with with your 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 user base and proactive. Like that's the biggest thing. I've seen so many product managers just just fail terribly because they were terrible at communicating and and they they just weren't proactive. They were waiting to be told, "Hey, we need this." And like, yeah, you could you can you can write a, a product spec. You could write a product requirements document. You can, you can manage a backlog. You can write great Jira stories that your engineers are like, cool. I know exactly what, why you want me to build that sign up flow or that, that share functionality. Cause I read the Jira story, but if you're not proactive and if you can't communicate, you're just, you're just going to fail. Like you have to take that initiative and be like, I own it. Like, this is mine. I care. I am the voice of the customer. I am the voice of the user. My stakeholders are looking to me. Like we've all been in companies where the executive level and even like 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 coworkers on the same 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 uh, coworker degree is they have a question about the product. Who's the first person they ask? They don't ask the engineers. They go track down the product manager. That that right there tells you like you need to be proactive. You need to know your stuff. You need to be able to answer questions. But it's okay. But the, also the caveat to that is is that if you don't know the answer, it's perfectly okay to go. You know what? I don't know, but I'm going to go find out and then go find out and come back and tell them. It's that's that's it's that's key. Just being proactive, being there, being invested. Like that. That's what you need to do. Like. Nut, nuts and bolts perspective. Like, yeah, it's good to have a, a bit of a tech background so you can talk to engineers. I'm not going to ask you to to go ahead and let's let's let architect a, a a you know another blockchain because we're coming up with something. But you do kind of need to be able to talk about things because again, you are going to be asked so many different questions from so many different people, and you need to be able to be able to at least answer as best as you can. Like that, that's the day-to-day, -day. that's the nuts and bolts. Like you need to be running it day-to-day -day and like 
I, I had one KPI for every single person that I've ever managed in my entire life. And it's the don't make me worry about you. That's it. I know it sounds very like hand wavy and spirit, but it's true. It's like, don't make me worry about you. Here are my expectations. You own this. You own it. If you need help, raise your hand. We'll talk. But you own this. I, I'm giving I'm giving you enough rope for you either, either to pull the ship in or hang yourself. <laughs> yeah. So I said, I'm a terrible manager. Like you should not, I should not manage people. But they keep letting you do it, right? Is that what you're I don't know. I don't know why. <laughs> I have no idea why, but they do. They do. So beware if someone applies to work for you. You've, you're very clear about what they're getting into. I, I think it's I'm a great sure. opportunity. Great, a great growth <laughs> opportunity you're giving them. That's what we're going to go with. <laughs> that, that, that's a good way to put it up. It's, it's the, why are you here? <laughs> why am I talking to you? Uh... Because I because I think NFTs were the dumbest thing that ever were created. You're hired. So we're talking about um like uh, the interview process or job application process. Um, maybe when you're looking at candidates, um, oh. whether you're getting applications um by resume or LinkedIn mm -hmm. or cold outreach uh, are, are blue. What are the, some of those job applications? Either X or red flags or things that you think candidates shouldn't put on their resume. Maybe. Um. Personally, I don't care about what skills you put on your resume. Like, you know, we've seen a lot of resumes where like you have that big like block of like skills, like, oh, I can do I can do Jira and I can use Confluence. Like I, I don't care. Like I, I truly don't care. The thing that matters to me the most is if I look at every single role that you've been in, it's it's kind of the okay, who hired you and why? originally say previous role like like on, on mine i was like you know i was hired by the ceo and the board of directors to oversee product management and development for a mid-stage startup that does xyz so like tell me your story you're supposed to be a product manager product manager should be able to tell stories but they also should be able to back those stories up with data so it's like tell me those things like i'm i'm if you don't have like this is what i did and this was the outcome like i joined and after eight months, we released a new feature that increased revenue by 17%. I like that. That tells me you did things that had an outcome. And even, it doesn't have to be, a. I mean, oh, I hope it's a positive one. It would be kind of bad <laughs> if it was the like, we released the product and we lost half of our users. Like, oh, okay. Well, that I, I will talk to you because I want to <laughs> hear that story. You're <laughs> like, what did you do? But that's it. It's like, I look at resumes, it's like they're t it tells me a narrative of like what you've done. And even, even early stage, like I've looked at resumes for very junior product people who have started off as like, well, I was an intern here, or I was an engineer for X amount of time. And, and, or I was, I was a product owner for like six months, getting my toes wet in product management and everything. But again, it's like, just tell me the story. Like, tell me what you did and what, what were the results? Because that's what I'm looking for because the people who look at me or that's what they're looking for. It's the, what did you do? And what was the outcome? And there you go. It's, it is very formulaic, but it makes it really, really easy. Cause I know the sound, this is going to be, you know, I appreciate like a very recruiter HR thing. Like I'm looking at your resume for like 15 seconds. I'm scanning it. I'm taking a look at it going like, do I want to talk to this person? And it's like, Oh, cool. This, 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 this. Awesome. I also don't care what company you've worked for. Like, I don't. In fact, there, there are some times where depending on which company you work for actually might be a detriment to depending on where I am. Like if I'm early stage or if, depending on the organization, and this is some free advice I received from people long time ago, is if you've worked for one of, we'll just call one of those big, big ones here in Silicon Valley, I'll let y'all imagine which ones. Like you take a look at it and it's like, wow, that looks amazing on a resume. They were there for two and a half years and da da da. But now they want to go to like, say, a smaller organization, maybe an early mid stage startup because they want more ownership and more everything like that. Honestly, like that can, I'm not saying it is, but it can be a little bit of a like, are you sure you want to do this? Because you're coming from an area that has so much structure and so much, like, it's a different world. It is a completely different world. You're going to go from, you have an entire support network of hundreds of people and you're doing one little thing that, that is your responsibility. 
and now you kind of want to jump in and do something broader. Are you going to be comfortable with this? Like, I personally think one of the one of the biggest gotcha questions that makes no sense to me is like if someone asks, well, are you going to be, are you going to be OK with ambiguity? And it's like, well, what do you mean by that? Like, am I going to walk in and be like, I was the product manager yesterday, but then then tomorrow I'm I'm now what? Like, what am I doing? Like, what do you mean by that? And they're like, but there are some people that can't adjust that. Like if they've been in those areas. So that's why I'm like, I don't, I don't care. Like, I don't care where it's like, I don't care what you are. I care who you are. That's what I care about. So here's my Schrodinger's, my Schrodinger's cat like kind of uh, response to that question. It's like, could you be more specific about what you mean about ambiguity? Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Could you give me five examples of of ambiguity? Five examples of ambiguity would be fantastic. Yeah, and then I'll I'll be able to answer that for you. Um, It's right up there with like, so what's your worst trait? (laughs) Like, I work too hard? I take interviews where people ask me that question? (laughs) <laughs> and I stressed about the answer too, right? Yeah. So not only am I there, then I'm, I'm just having a melt. I'm, <laughs> I'm having a meltdown on my on my side of Zoom, going like, "Oh my god, oh my god!" It's just like my therapist said, "I'm worthless. I don't know what I'm doing." I mean, the, the comments about about resumes was uh, was great, Jason. If I didn't know better, um, I might suspect you of having listened to our last podcast episode. A little bit, so, you know. I love uh, that guy. Um, <laughs> yeah. Although the sound quality is probably not as good as this time, um, but anyway. <laughs> but it's true. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I don't care where you worked. Like, I don't care. Look, you spent three years at Google. That's fantastic. What did you do there? And and how does that translate into we're not Google? <laughs> so I love that. Okay, now we have a few quick fire round questions. Um, You've been giving your honest opinion a whole time. So let's just keep on going. I'm curious to hear <laughs> this question. What has been your worst job or work experience? You already said you have stories. So oh. pick a good nugget for us. Um, okay. So one of my, my first, like I said, my, my, my first job was, was at I, was IBM. And this was at the end of 1999, beginning of 2000. And it was at their e-business studio. And I'll try to keep this short as, as best as I can. Um, it was their e-business studio. So imagine 2000, the internet in 2000. Like, there's this thing called e-commerce and people can buy stuff through their computers. And it's like, yeah, okay, that's cool. And uh, IBM uh, was working with a, I will just say a major... Well, formerly major, I don't even know if they're around there longer, um, a major brick and mortar retailer that was one of the, kind of the first retail to go online to actually like have a website where you could buy things. And it was huge. It was this website was tens of millions of dollars. Keep in mind, it's 2000. Um you know, coal powered servers and everything like that. And I was the continuity director for the checkout flow. And it was like big deal, big, big deal. We launched, we're like, all right, we worked late nights. I I slept in the office a couple of times. Like this was old school, which is kind of giving you an idea of how old I am now. Um, And we launched and we waited and we saw massive traffic and people were purchasing and it was fantastic. We celebrated. I went home. We had a day off. I'm eight hours into my day off and I get a phone call from the CTO. He's like, you need to come into the office now. We're having a meeting. I'm like, oh, this should be good. Oh, no. (laughs) So we went into the office and it was the entire team. There was 45 of us who were, who were in a room with the CTO of IBM. And on the phone was the CFO and the CEO of this particular brick and mortar real t- uh, retail company. And they're like, we're seeing something not right in our numbers. We know you have re- you've run the numbers and the data and everything like that. How much how much how many sales have we done? We 
there real quick. Oh, we'll take a look. Oh, we've done all these sales and everything like that. Look, the data right here, we're looking in our database and everything is fine. Um, they're like, great, great. Um, we're not recording any revenue. What happened was because we were just burning ourselves to death, and I don't want to use this as an excuse, um, we never switched the credit card checkout function to production from our staging sandbox. What that allowed is any credit card could, it would, you could put in any credit card number. This is way before Stripe. Um, any credit card number, and it would automatically go through and it would count in the database as a purchase, as a sale, which was the only thing that mattered back then. Problem was, is the card wouldn't get charged. <laughs> <laughs> we determined that in, in a seven hour period, there was about five and a half million dollars of revenue that wasn't captured. And, but it was already approved on the, on the customer side. The customer saw you're already approved, everything like that. And it went through the entire process of like, oh, well, your, your, your jeans and your sweater top are going to be shipped to you. Their credit cards never got charged. So, yeah, <laughs> that was my first, like, well, I'm going to start looking around at w what fast food place I can get a job at after this one. And, and it was that, that whole, like we, everything smoothed out. Everything was fine. The, the, this particular retailer did a brilliant marketing campaign, brief one to the people who purchased, um, because they couldn't just sit there and go like, oh, well, Hey, you need to pay us again because it was like this weird thing in credit card because there was a big delay and it showed all that kind of stuff. It showed it was pending, but never showed up and all that kind of stuff. So they sent out like a mass email going like, Hey, as our first users, we're going to, we're going to give you this credit to your thing. Like they, it was a master class on how they kind of backed <laughs> out of it because there was no way they could get like, go up to their customers and be like, yo, you still owe us money. It's not, your socks aren't free. Um, <laughs> but it was just that whole thing of like, you know what? Maybe we should do some more testing before we roll something out like this. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's no technical screw up that marketing and PR can't solve. Oh, hundred <laughs> percent. Like you know, bless them. Let's, and I feel so sorry for them. Like it's 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 that's why. Hey, pro product managers, if if you have a marketing department, get really good with them. Not not so not just because eventually they will cover you if you screw up, but. Also, they're, they're also there. They have just as much of a vested interest in what you do and everything like that with the users and stuff like that. Like you need to be best friends with your marketing department and customer service. Um, also, like, we, as, uh, like you asked me earlier, one thing that I also highly recommend every product manager does, if your company does have a form of customer service, spend two days doing customer service. Highly recommend it. You will you will learn so much about about your customers and your users that you will never learn without doing it. So, but yeah, that's that's one of many. <laughs> <laughs> but that was kind of like my first big like marquee one of the whole thing. Of like, well, I guess I'm done. But you stuck but with then, it. You stayed it. <laughs> we they they were they were so so kind. They were so <laughs> kind, and they 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 looked they looked at this this poor this 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 poor young boy fre <laughs> fresh out of fresh out of the midwest not really but still fresh off of the bus and in, in california and like you know what he's got gumption he doesn't know how to build a damn website apparently but we're gonna give him another shot <laughs> and so you talked about um working late nights and that being yeah. maybe something of the early 2000s or, or yeah. turn of the century how are you balancing your work and other things in your life right now I try. Um, I mean, it, I I will absolutely give give this the the pandemic and and millennial Gen Z like thank you, not thank you for the pandemic, but but thank you for really echoing like there's been a seismic shift in in society because because of the pandemic, and I personally think it's in a positive way. Um, the whole that whole grind culture that was kind of a thing you know like kind of before the pandemic and during the pandemic i'm glad it's kind of gone away because it's like what are you trying to prove 
like to, to to Lisa, what you asked earlier, like how how do you think AI will help us? It's like it's it's working smarter and not harder. And honestly, that's kind of how I balance. Like I I have boundaries. I have, I have very clear boundaries. And the thing is, I will fully admit, like I'm I'm very fortunate to be able to have these boundaries because where I am in my career and and how I've I've gone to stuff like that. But for those of you who are kind of like starting off and things like that, I understand that there is a very very uh, like perceived need of of the like I just I just have to grind I just have to do this I have to show my value I have to answer Slack messages at eleven o'clock at night I just I just have to do this My only thing that I would say to you is like ask your like be your, you are your first product so you need to ask yourself like why do I feel I need to do this Like why do I feel that I need to a- answer a Slack message at eleven o'clock at night when I'm gonna be I'm gonna be back online at like eight thirty or eight eight thirty Like why do I need to do this and it's it's setting those boundaries and it's like that's why i'm kind of it's also interesting to see like these massive tech companies who who are are getting backlash from from like nope you need to you know there's another one on the east coast i won't mention their name but their ceo recently you know released the thing going like y'all need to be working harder and it's like why working harder doesn't necessarily mean success it's working smarter um and that that's how I do it. It's like I have I have like when I'm when I'm off, I'm off. Like when I'm when I'm on vacation and I try to take at least two to three weeks a year, like I don't exist. And then there's little pockets like, you know, this is the new world. Like I, I work from home. This is my office. This has been my office for almost four years. And it's like I have chunks. I have breaks like af- after this, I'm going to go off and I'm going to walk my dogs. And like, just to get out, just, you got to unplug, you got, got to get away from the screens. And that's the only way to kind of balance it. Um, it's awesome. If you're passionate about your work, you, you should be, you should be passionate about your work. If you're not passionate about your work, you should probably find something else. You need to balance that with some sort of passion in your, in, in your personal life. Like, and I'm not going to yuck your yum. I mean, whatever you want to do, like if your thing is, is like, I'm going to go on a five, I'm going to go on a five hour hike starting at four o'clock in the morning awesome no that's great or it's the i'm gonna take an hour every single day and i'm going to walk away from my my computer i'm gonna walk away from slack i'm gonna leave my phone down and i'm gonna take one of the many books that i'm reading and i'm gonna go in my backyard and i'm gonna read for an hour and i'm just gonna unplug it's you you have to find that balance like you don't have to wait until you're 20 year veteran executive who's got a team of people underneath you and you can delegate and everything like that. They're not, I'll give you, I'll I'll let you in on a secret. We're not the ones burning out. So find that balance. I learned that a long time ago. I learned that early. Like, no. I feel like you've in answering that question and others, you've given us a lot of really good tips and advice you would give for people starting out and maintaining a career. So on the flip side, I'm just very curious. What's the worst advice you have heard or been given? So we can make sure to not take that advice ourselves. <laughs> oh, what's the worst advice I've I've ever I, I I ever received? Other than for for back in 2004, somebody said, you know, Google's going to start trading at eighty six dollars a share. You should you 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 you. It's not going to be a big deal. I mean, they're only a search engine. Oh, okay. Yeah, that that was great advice. Um, <laughs> um, I I think I think the worst advice I got, especially as as an early product manager, was that you know, it's all on your shoulders. You're the CEO, so you need to have that mindset. You need to have. 100% ownership and your decision is what's going to affect the product. It's that whole like very singular, it's about you mindset, like your product is you, it's it's success is your success. You know that and and I don't know, maybe I'm wrong now, but and people may disagree, but I'm like that's nonsense. Like great things aren't built in vacuums. Like they're not. And, and without that, like I've always said, like diversity breeds innovation. And, and it's, and having that advice of like, no, 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 it's all on you. Like you, you need to focus on like, you need to be the driver. It's like, 
I disagree that you have to be the driver, like be the conductor. Again, I'm full of aphorisms. Um, <laughs> it's be the conductor because uh, it, you aren't going to have 100% control. Like you're just not. That's reality. And if you can harness the people around you who are just as bought into it as you are, it that that's that's what makes it great. Like trying to do it all yourself. That I was always like, it's all on you. Like I, I, there was an executive at a at a big company I worked for in the past. Literally told me he's like, the responsibility falls on your shoulders a hundred percent. If anything goes wrong, you're the one responsible for it. And that's when I literally had in my head a go, why the hell does anyone want to be a product manager then? <laughs> Like seriously, like if that's if that's kind of the the philo- if that's kind of the philosophy, it's like okay. So if my product is a massive success, then I did my job. But if anything goes wrong, like say engineering screws something up, or we do a marketing campaign that like all of our users go forget this, I'm going to the competitor. It's my fault. Like no, like if that's the case, why on earth would I ever want to be a product manager? <laughs> yeah. It's like that, that was the worst advice. That was literally the worst advice I, w- I was given. It's like, it's all, it's all on your shoulders. It's like, no, it's not. It's like, well, the advice was you need to think about, think as if it is all on your shoulders, that you are the one who's solely responsible for it. And that needs to be your drive. Like, no, don't. That's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. Mm, sounds like a stressful uh, place to be, right? Like, say, like, who, 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 yeah, who wants, <laughs> who, who really wants that job? Um, um, Moving on then. Um, so can you give us a book or podcast recommendation for people that want to be uh, stars in product management? Oh, I mean, there's so many out there. I'm, I'm old school. Um, podcast wise, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, only because the, the man is infinitely smarter than I am. And, and most of us. Um, book wise, if it is not, if this book isn't on your shelf, you are not a product manager. It's measure what matters. That is like, that is my Bible. It isn't, the, there's a whole bunch. There's like, there's zero to one. And then there's all stuff, but it's measure what matters. I cannot tell you how many conversations I have had all the way up to C-suite and even above like board of directors and things like that, where it's the, why does this metric matter to you? Like, why do you care about this OKR? Like measure what matters is like, it is a Bible in product management. And I promise when I share my affiliate link on Amazon and I can make some money off of it, you will not be disappointed. No. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's measure what matters. It's highly recommend. Mine's all dog-eared and marked up. Sounds well, that does a... lead us nicely into, is there anything that we can help you with right now? If you would like to pitch for something, are you looking for people to reach out and help you with anything? How can we help you for being our esteemed guest. Oh, y'all, y'all have been absolutely amazing. Like hearing me babble and rant and, 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 and all of that. Like I said, I'm, I, I'm just one, I'm one product manager on the planet who has done some things that, that, that's it. There are so, there are so many, uh, here's, here's what you can do for me. Actually, here's what you can do for me, but it's not for me, but here's what you can do for me. Um, <laughs> The, the, the tech industry is bananas right now and has been for the last year and a half. Um, and it looks like it's probably going to be for the next couple of months, the way things are kind of looking and stuff like that. What I could really use y'all's help on from that recruiting HR resource, that, that kind of side is, and I know y'all do, but I just want to get it out there. It's, it's the candidates are more than just the piece of paper that they submit to your ATS. And I, I feel like we're kind of swinging into, and I may be hyperbolic, but I feel we're swinging into, especially in product management, because again, ask five people what a product manager does, you're going to get five different answers, is that it's kind of becoming a, I'm about to contradict myself now that I'm thinking about it. Companies are looking for unicorn product people because they don't know what they want. And because of that, we are becoming commodities. It's, it's the, 
I saw a job listing where they were looking for someone with a PhD in machine learning with eight years experience in AI work. So, you know, the person who invented it. And, and it's, it's like, I think from, and I'm not like you two specifically, because maybe in a little, in a little while, my, I'm, I'm still getting my feet wet at my, at my new, ex, my new adventure and everything like that. So I will talk, um, mm -hmm. but like in general for, for, for product people out there, like they're more than just a piece of paper. I m broadcast that like product people are like engineers. They're brilliant. They are brilliant, brilliant, brilliant individuals. Designers are artists. Marketing and sales are just just masterclass in public speaking and everything like that. Product managers were kind of all of that, kind of rolled into a this is what the world thinks we do. So that would be my ask if it makes sense. Like we'll do our best time. Jason, we promise. Aw. And 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 we, we have that on record. Ha. <laughs> You can hold us to it. Oh, oh yeah, we will. Yeah, Jason, we're at time, but but, uh, and I know you have to go. So, but thank you ever so much. Amazing insights today, and and a great role model, I think, for people that are trying to make their way uh, in tech and product and and all those associated careers. Um, can't thank you enough, and uh, look forward to uh, to sharing this with you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, thank you. Dale. Thank you so much. It's it's been a pleasure, and thank you for listening to me rant and rave and and Babylon. So I appreciate it. Cheers. Take Cheers. Care. Bye. Well, that was amazing. I thought, uh, I think, um, for, for listeners don't know, so uh, Jason and I were colleagues in, in, in a previous life. Uh, and I thought to myself, who's going to be an awesome guest uh, for job math? And I thought Jason. And uh, yeah, I think he, he, he maundered for us um, some really great advice. And um, and uh, smug faces all around that he um, uh, backed up some of the things we were saying about resumes and job applications and stuff uh, in, in one of our recent episodes as well. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I thought he was great. I really appreciated his take on storytelling, right? And moving beyond just particular things to thinking holistically and about how the industry has changed. So I think for any listeners who are seeing their careers change or looking for that next step, it's good to remember that the industry is changing too, but we can still do what we love and ebb and flow as sort of technology changes things or as work cultures start to change. I loved hearing how he's been able to evolve, but stay with the passion in the field that he loves of product management. Yeah, 100%. Um, I think we can wrap there. Um... All the links to all the relevant things we'll put it in the in the doobly doo doos guys. Um, and Lisa, we, we're still working out what our sign off thing is, but um, <laughs> thank you everyone and look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Bye.